Welcome back to a very British space program. You find us on the launch pad with another Trident booster ready to go. Um, last time we put a probe around the moon barely, its avionics barely functioned, its electrics were terrible and its other systems were just not right. So let's try and do this again. Let's go and orbit the moon properly this time. Let's get going. So off we go, and you've seen this launch before, so I'm going to speed it up a little bit. We're just playing around a little bit with rotation. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with it. Um, so last time we put the Pilgrim 1A into uh, sort of orbit of the moon. It was very, uh, shall we say, bodgy. It was very, very British, very bodgy British. Actually quite Russian in its uh, entirety. Anyway, this is going to be the 1B. So what have we done to change it? Well, first of all, we, we decoupled the side boosters at the right time this time instead of uh, in what was a horrible, shall we say, mistiming last time. And uh, our our stage transitions are beautiful, actually. This this craft went up lovely. We've actually learned a lot about the ascent profile from our first craft. So, you know, note to self, probably should have done a, a, a non-payloaded launch with a dumb weight just to test it, as you would actually find to sort of, you know... Um, in a lot of craft we haven't we actually just used a, uh, a system we get some air electricity warnings that's the electricity in the side boosters running out but we get warnings anyway about it and we're on to our third stage um what have we changed well the pilgrim now has uh, an operated core it's got um, a little bit more electricity on board it's uh, been just refined a little bit we checked the antenna made sure that's got the right ranges on it and things like that we've upgraded it to the maximum level we have we do need to improve our antenna tech though because it's right on the limit right now we're definitely going to go interplanetary for a long time so we put our position together our maneuver node together we plan for our, our plot to to the moon the moon and yeah we're, we're actually going to come in at what looks like a very much an equatorial plane, which is brilliant because we never actually did that. You can see the Pilgrim 1A still in its sort of semi-orbit about the moon. We still want to try and complete these missions from last time. So we're going to uh, just get ourselves lined up, accelerate, do our normal burst of RCS and then fire off our Spectre engine that fires us off. We've also refined the gimbal on this engine a little bit. We've brought it down a little bit so it's not as gimbly, it doesn't overreact as much. And because we've also had done that, we've also had a look at the positioning, just refined some of the RCS ports on this craft, just so that actually we've got a bit of the control that we want. So there we go. We fire ourselves into the sphere of influence of uh, the moon. And then we're just gonna use our RCS just to refine that orbit a little bit. We're gonna put ourselves really close to it, as close to the surface as really sensibly possible. And uh, then we're gonna decouple our craft. And this one looks very much the same as one here, but it is just a little bit more up to date. It's improved, it's just refined. You can see it does a little bit of movement there, sorts itself out, brilliant. So we go through time nice and quick. We're at what, seven days later now, and we come into the sphere of influence of the moon. We're gonna come along, and this is it. This is such a much better flight than the Pilgrim one here. This is, you know, the, that was the Pathfinder. This is the real deal. We're gonna put ourselves, hopefully, into orbit. So we're doing a nice burn near the moon this time instead of way out. So we're being much more efficient. We've got the all-birth effect working for us right now. This does take a long time to do this burn. And one of the big issues, because we're using the RCS ports, we can't plot it in the same way that you normally would. You can see we've got a lot of rotational forces going on. We've got like oscillation in the craft and it's really annoying actually. But in order to have the ability to roll it, we have to have ports to allow roll. So we've got that. I could actually turn off the roll control and just let it spin on its axis and it wouldn't actually affect it. Um, so here we are, we're just basically just burning as much as we can now to try and capture you can see where it takes a while we just try and burn and burn and burn and burn and uh, there we are we are we are pretty much in orbit we're going to refine the orbit over time but um for now we're done so there we go we're just going to refine it a little bit every time it comes around you can see we're, 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 we're five days in or whatever it's been quite a quick transfer actually we're just going to refine and refine and refine and bring that orbit down to exactly what we want to complete the different tasks. So we've got the lunar flyby completed. We're going to do the lunar orbit sorted. Now, X planes high contract. Um, the last time you saw the white javelin, it was in bits. And, um, well, Carol, <laughs> Carol wasn't in the best of books, shall we say. 
So we've rebuilt it. We've taken what we learned from the White Javelin 1B and the 1A before it. Um, we've made sure that uh, that Carol isn't going to fly it this time and we've rebuilt it with some slight improvements. So we're going to take this x contract, we're going to go to 130 kilometers. We're on the edge of space. We're, we're about to touch it. We've gone over the Karma line. Now we're on the edge of space. Probably the next flight we do will be into space. So we put Matthew in the cockpit because Carol is not to be trusted anymore. She's now broken two of our planes. Um, we don't have many left, in fact. Um, and he's, he's basically going to go for it. Um, he's he's aiming for 130 kilometers. Once he actually gets up there, though, he, he radios in and he's like, you know what, I can push this higher, I can push this higher. He wants to go for 140. He wants to be the person that basically is considered to be in space. But we say nope, and he follows the rules because he is he's a, he's a professional. Um, he does reach a staggeringly high speed actually uh, at one point when, on his return he, he he gets pretty much close to 2000 meters per second which is i believe the fastest that we've actually ever had and you can see on re-entry he is all over the place there absolutely all over the place it's this is this is like no one has ever experienced this is the fastest and highest that any kerbal has ever gone in re-entry we get a lot of heating but we you notice we pull up and we get a lot of g-force but we actually managed to do a little bit of a hop so he's actually converting on that. When we get down to 25 kilometers, we've actually hopped and we actually get a little bit of a bump up. Um, so it's more almost like a skip glide. And we need to maybe look into that. This is a craft that we could maybe work with that. It's got a nice bit of wing surface area to it. So if we're gonna try and develop some sort of skip glide, which might be useful if we do go orbital with any of these craft or near orbital, this will be the craft for that. So he does avoid spinning on his, on his way down slows down nice and late in his descent just so that it's not too uh, shall we say boring and also because um he wants to he wants to get down in a safe manner the concern we have with this craft is if we slow down too soon it might actually sort of tumble and fall shall we say um so we have to keep it because it's gliding it's unpowered we have to be quite careful about maintaining that speed so he's coming down the engines, the wings are down, the wings are down, the wheels are down. He's just dipping the tail, dipping the tail, dipping the tail, and puts it down. And then he pops up the uh, the tail fin at the back there, which I think I'm not sure if I like it or not. But the air brakes work. He's down. Superb. Sorted. Brilliant. Best flight ever. We have another flight contract, which is suborbital flight. And um, yeah, Matthew wanted to do it, but... Um, well, the team in the UK have been working on something as well. While we've got the White Javelin 1 back in business in Australia, they've come up with something just a little bit different. This is the White Javelin 2A. Let's have a look, shall we? There we go. Kim Jarvis, stationed in the UK, is flying the White Javelin 2A. This is a much thinner craft. It's, it's pretty much the same fuselage, fuselage, large, you can't say that word design as the one but it's got its wings basically amputated you can see that they they are they have the same sort of rake at the start and everything but it's a much more sort of arrow like craft and this this is the uh, the alternative design that we're going to test so this is the white javelin 2a nicknamed beaumont so roland beaumont was a british fighter pilot he was wing commander roland Prosper B. Beaumont. He got a CBE, a DSO bar, he got all sorts of things. He was a British fighter pilot uh, for the Royal Air Force and he was also an experimental test pilot during and after the Second, First, uh, Second World War. Um, on the 25th of November 1957, he reached Mark II in an English electric lightning in a different timeline because we don't have those in this one. And so that's why we've chosen that name. So you can see Kim becomes the first Kerbal to leave the atmosphere. She goes all the way up, uh, all the way up there to a beautiful height of about 160 kilometers, a bit more, more than was required actually. And uh, she's returning. And, and here we see this wonderful little return coming through the atmosphere. She's got a lot of speed. We've got a lot of heating coming on. It's got a wobble on. There's a lot of G-force. I think we need to definitely work on that. So she knows down on the way in. I think what we're gonna do is try and belly flop it in. Um, this craft has another little thing that's uh, special about it, which is um, it doesn't have any landing legs or wheels or anything. In fact, it's going to use the um, parachute landing approach, shall we say. Um, this is not 
completely crazy. You know, we had uh, the Gemini capsule at one point was you know planned to have wings and a paragliding type para parafoil approach. The US have got some X planes they've actually affixed uh, paragliders and parachutes on to land them. So we're just we're just you know the British are just developing an alternative approach which is to use parachutes. And so she's bringing it in and we're going to pull it down to a reasonable altitude, slow it down and we'll pop the parachute so she can float down. We're going to land her in the water though because, you know, water is safer than solid ground and this thing is obviously waterproof. So we'll just do that. We deploy the parachutes, slow down, air brakes pop out, everything slows us down nice and easy, slowly float down. And you know what? She's wonderful. First, first person to leave the atmosphere and return safely wonderful what could possibly have gone wrong because that craft is beautiful unfortunately we didn't account for Kerbal water physics so yeah that's gone horribly wrong however I could have re I could have reloaded or something but I did not we're going to keep it as it is she had a bit of a, an incident in landing in water so we'll try and avoid that in future um, you can see a couple of bits of wing have broken off so we're gonna have to rebuild that I think we're gonna have to prepare it now not to be outdone the australian team yep they're not happy they didn't get to get to the first person out of the atmosphere so matthew uh, matthew is gonna go for it he's he's got into the uh the the white javelin 1c and he is going to prove that their craft and you can actually see from this position here just the difference in wing structure the the, the change in shape between the two crafts is quite significant this will be a much better sort of skip glider because of its wings um, the other one potentially um, we'll see what its future holds so both of them are basically being trialed at the moment and i just like the idea of a competition between the two um so anyway he is going to be taking it to 170 kilometers so that's uh, he wants to basically hold the record for the highest height shall we say um he wants to uh, do everything he can to to be the best um he, he's quite scared though obviously as he goes up high hits the top there the rcs system's on this is something that both of them have been designed from the ground up with rcs something that the uh, the white arrows never had he's going to bring it back down and he's going to put the nose down on re-entry so we've tried a, a sort of belly flop down now we're going to try a nose down and see how this craft deals with this a lot of these flights were actually just about developing the ideas of how to re-enter because at some point we're going to have to send a craft into orbit and they, while this these little suborbital hops for these crafts are interesting it's going to help us as a, as a space program understand what's going on um we don't have any capsules or anything at the moment and uh, I, we're, we're not that close to getting them but we need to start understanding re-entry sort of physics we've we've done this sort of similar thing with unmanned craft we've done the sort of re-entry program now we're doing the manned version to try and see about in re-entry physics and what's going on um of course this is the 7th of december 1958 and we've now sent two people one after the other into suborbital flight which is wonderful um, the difference being this one is going to try and actually land on its wheels which is you know uh, traditionally difficult for some of the team um oh no no we're just going to pull the parachutes because if they can use parachutes why can't the australian team lose parachutes but we've got nice wheels to land on there we go so first flight of 19 uh, of 1959 is going to be um, something a little different. It's going to be uh, an Oculus 1A and we're going to attempt an orbital return. Um, we're going to try and also bring back some, some photographs of the Earth in all of its glory. So we've, we sent up a TV camera, but it's not very good pictures. Um, <clears throat> so we're going to hopefully send up a craft to do that. So on, uh, on pretty much... Oh, yeah, there we go. On New Year's Eve 1958, we roll it out onto the pad and we launch it on January the 5th, 1959. And uh, here it is. Um, we've heard that the USSR, USSR sorry, have a craft heading to the moon. Um, so we're a little concerned that they're actually going to be joining us around the moon. Um, clearly, it's evident their launch capability was much better than we thought it was because it seems they're using the same craft that they've used to put things into orbit which is absolutely unbelievable that's like the equivalent of us using this red princess 4b to put something around the moon we just it would not be able to do it maybe if we 
have stuck them together. That's an idea. If we put a few, few of these next to each other. Anyway, um, we're hopeful that they uh, succeed, obviously, because we like to see the progress of others. Although it is quite nice to be the only nation around the moon at the moment. There anyway, so here we are. We're sending our camera up into orbit. Um, you can see on the top there, we're using our standard approach. We've got the engines running. On the top, we've got a camera return, a camera unit, a full camera unit. We've got a return capsule on the top. We've got some interesting little avionics approaches there. We've got rid of the, the fairings as we go. We're hoping to bring back some really nice pictures of the Earth, primarily of the Russian launch sites, because we'd quite like to look at what they've been doing. So this craft is going in a sort of polar launch. Um, we'll see. <clears throat> we'll see how it goes. Uh, it'd be quite nice to get some good pictures, I think, because uh, there's some stuff going on that we, we really need uh, to figure out what's going on around the world. So we're going to, you know, obviously it's just for, for the natural history that we're doing this. We just want to forest fires and things like that. That's what we're doing. Not at all espionage. Not nothing like that would be at all involved in this spacecraft program at all. No. Anyway, so we, we're getting to orbit reasonably easily. Use our RCS just to refine the orbit a little bit. Um, and we're aiming just to uh, to keep it in orbit and long enough to get some pictures. The, the contract requires that we return it, but it doesn't say we have to return it straight away. So we're going to turn around its delivery craft, put a bit of RCS burn on, hopefully take it out of uh, out of orbit or out of near Earth orbit. At least we'll try and dip it into the atmosphere. And as we as I leave you, I'm going to leave our camera in orbit. We'll come back next time to bring it down and see if we can actually develop some interesting pictures. So until next time, have a great one.